Good morning. Welcome to this time of worship with First Baptist Church of Fort Payne, Alabama. I'm Marshall Henderson, the pastor of First Baptist Church. Our church exists because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we believe that the gospel is at the very heart of the message of the Bible, and it's at the very heart of who we are as God's people. It means that the gospel forms every part of our lives and it informs every dimension of who we are and what we do as God's people. So in light of the gospel, we live for the sake of Jesus Christ. And we desire as a church to make Jesus Christ known through heartfelt worship, through disciple making, through missional living, and through devoting ourselves to one another in community. So today, however you're watching, I want you to know that the desire of our leadership is that you enter into a genuine and heartfelt time of worship with us as a church. Jesus is worthy of our praise, and he is worthy of all of our attention and our affection. And now, for all who are weary and need rest, and for all who mourn and long for comfort, and for all who fail and desire strength, and for all who sin and need a Savior, this church opens wide its doors to you, you are welcomed into worship this morning with a welcome that comes from Jesus Christ. Welcome to worship. Well, good morning. Welcome, friends. Welcome into worship. I'm so glad you're here today. It is a privilege each and every week to gather together with brothers and sisters uh, united in praise for Jesus Christ. Uh, if you are a guest with us this morning, welcome in. Uh, be honored here in this place. I hope that your experience overall this morning is one of welcome, uh, one where you feel as if you belong uh, here today. So welcome in. If we haven't met before, I'm Marshall. I'm the pastor here. I'd love to meet you after the service. I'm always right here after the service, so I'd love to connect with you more. Uh, if you are a guest, you should know that there is a guest information card located in the pew rack in front of you. If you would, you can fill that out today. You can drop that in the offering plate uh, that's located in the foyer behind you as you exit today. If you're here this morning as a guest and you're a parent, you have young children who go to children's church later on in the service, Children's Church leads in the middle of the service. You pick them up on the second floor uh, afterward. Uh, but there's also a name tag in the pew rack there for you. Uh, one part of it you fill out. Uh, one part of it you, you, you put on the, the child before the child goes to Children's Church. So there's a little information there for you. Uh, this morning, as I welcome you into worship, uh, as I call you into worship, I, I want us to just really focus in that we are here today to discover more and more the heart of God. We are here today to see and to experience the contour of God's smile through Jesus Christ. So let me tell you about our God a little bit this morning as we begin worship. The scripture tells us that God is in the heavens and he does whatever he pleases. There is wonder to his very being. He existed before time and he created everything that exists. The scriptures tell us that he can hold the oceans in the palm of his hands, that all the nations are but a drop in the bucket to him. The scriptures tell us that the Lord has filled the universe with his splendor and his glory. Now get this. And that God, he chooses to be near to us. We learn from the scriptures also that the Lord Jesus Christ is gentle and lowly, that God stoops to make the insignificant significant. He loves the lowly, and God hasn't come here to meet with us today to scold us, 
but to win us to his heart. And this is why the psalmist says things like this. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. It's why through the centuries, followers of Jesus have exclaimed together, blessed be the name of the Lord. It's not because of ourselves, it's not because of themselves, but it's because throughout the centuries, people have known the character and the heart of God. So, for all who are weary and need rest, and for all who mourn and long for comfort, for all who are burdened and need a river of rescuing grace, for all who fail and desire strength, and for all who sin and need a Savior. This church opens wide its doors to you because the Lord Jesus Christ has opened wide his arms to you. Welcome into worship this morning with the welcome that comes from the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we want to begin worship this morning, if you would. Uh, our call to worship is from Philippians chapter 3. We want to read a portion of Scripture together. We love Scripture here at First Baptist Church, Fort Payne. And so we want to read some together. This is in order to prime our hearts for where worship will take us today. So if you would stand with me. This is Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 through 14. I'll begin with the portions in white. If you'll join with me in the portions in yellow. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I might gain Christ and be found in him, having, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may, share, uh, and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may obtain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on to the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let's sing together. Name.
Good morning. So boys and girls, if I were to ask you to tell me what makes you happy, what would your answer be? Would it be something like happiness is scoring the winning goal in a soccer game? Or happiness is being the most popular person in my class? Or happiness is having the, the coolest toy? We all want to be happy, don't we? But what we've been learning from Matthew chapter 5 is that what Jesus said about how to be happy is different from what you and I might expect. Most of us think that to be happy, we must have a lot of money, we must have all the coolest things, or we must be well-liked by everyone. But that's not what Jesus said. Jesus said things like, be happy when you feel you've lost what is most dear to you. Because it's then you will feel the love of the one who is most dear to you. Jesus said, be happy with what you have. Because then you will find that your heavenly father provides everything you need. Jesus said, be happy when you're caring for others. Because it's in caring for others you'll find you have a heavenly father who cares for you. Jesus said, be happy when your heart is right with God. Because it's then you will see that God is at work in the world around you. And Jesus said, be happy when others treat you badly because you follow Jesus, because your reward will be great in heaven. So happiness is not a feeling that's brought about by the things that we have, nor by the things that happen to us. It's an attitude that we have because of our relationship with God. Only God can make us truly happy. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for sending Jesus to die for our sins, to make a way for us to have a relationship with you. Father, help us to love you, to trust you, and to follow you with all our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. continue our singing. We sing next, uh, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. It's found in the hymnal at number 98, or you'll see the words, of course, on the screen. Remain seated as we sing together. <laughs>
out of the smoke, out of our night of struggle, can we see a ray of hope? city of angels, but we can build a city of Today's scripture reading comes from Matthew 5, verses 1 through 16. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? Uh, it is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. 
You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. This is the word of the Lord. The choir's anthem is, in fact, a musical setting of that very scripture. As been our practice through this entire series by our pastor, we then sing the scripture that you've heard read for the morning. So today, the choir sings that passage. <laughs>
As we continue our worship together, we sing now the uh, very familiar Amazing Grace, found at 104 in your hymnal, or the words, of course, will be on the screen. I'll ask that you stand and let's sing together. you may be seated. Children, you're dismissed to Children's Church at this time. You know, I've never been to Children's Church, but I think they're probably having a great time down there. You have to go sometime, yeah. Busy during this time, I suppose. How we doing? Good. Let's talk about persecution. So, blessed are the persecuted. You know, all, all the Beatitudes are strange. Uh, they are. Uh, we think through what's been sung by our choir. We think through the passage that Alexander read for us earlier in the service. These are these opening statements of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, uh, his most famous recorded sermon. 
And, and here we are in the strangeness of chapter 5 of Matthew, verses 11 and 12. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And you think, you, you hear this, Jesus spoke this in real time, and you think, what kind of teacher is Jesus? What kind of teacher was Jesus? Is this, is this just another one of those hopelessly nonsensical paradoxes he gives? Blessed are the persecuted? And you think, rejoice and be glad, and you're like, what do I have to rejoice and be glad about? I'm addicted to comfort and convenience. That's the name of the game. You think if you're, if you're a teen, a middle schooler, or a high schooler right now, when you hear these words of Jesus, blessed are the persecuted, blessed are you when people speak evil against you, you think, what good does that do me in middle school and high school? If you're someone who's now on the outskirts of a friend group because you care too much about Jesus, what, what are these words? Like, What does this have for you? Or if you're a worker, an employee, in, in fear of losing your job because you won't fix the numbers, like your boss wants you to. Blessed are the persecuted, huh? You know, if this is your first week here with us as we're studying through, this is actually our eighth week in these Beatitudes, these opening statements. And we think about this when Jesus walked on the earth. Uh, he called disciples to himself. Uh, he said things like, follow me, come and learn from me internalize my teachings, and when you internalize my teachings, you find rest for your souls. When you internalize my teachings and live by them, you actually find life. And we have to think about this, because every time that Jesus makes a disciple out of us, meaning Jesus says, come follow me, he's teaching us a new way. He's also doing what you might call counter-discipleship. He's also unteaching us some things. He's also helping us to unlearn some things so we might embrace his teaching. Now, if you're a thoughtful person this morning, you know that this call to discipleship, to follow Jesus, we, we know that for all of us and for all of us each and every day, we don't wake up uh, neutral people. We don't wake up as a blank slate for Jesus to write this kind of life upon. In fact, all through life, we are steadily discipled by things all around us, and we continue to be. We have other allegiances that inform our thoughts, we have other allegiances that give us a vision for the good life. Uh, it shows us uh, what the good life is, and, and as we embrace those allegiances, as we think those thoughts, as we go that way, it actually forms us into a certain kind of disciple. We are not blank slaves. We are constantly being discipled. And I want you to know, if, if you're newer to Jesus, if you're newer to the idea of church or the message of the Christian faith, uh, these things that Jesus calls us to, these things are not in the fine print. It's not a bait, bait and switch. Jesus offers, Jesus invites, and Jesus ultimately demands us to walk in an entirely new way of being. Jesus invites us and uh, encourages us and offers us and demands that we live by a life that's reorganized by the economy and the values of the kingdom of heaven. So we, yes, we do have to unlearn some things. We do have to unthink some things. Jesus gives us a brand new framework for living. So each beatitude, much like the one today, comes to us with this weight of counter-discipleship moving in the opposite direction. So it's not, this morning, a ridiculous paradox, but Jesus, with all of these statements, gives us a completely new vision for the good life. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers in this world. It's new. It's a new way of living. And also blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. And still, when you get to that one, right? Right? Pure in heart, got it, sounds like a God thing. Peacemaker, sounds like a God thing. Still, when you get to blessed with the persecuted, I didn't see that one coming, right? I didn't expect that. Never expect that. Let's explore the statement of Jesus. 
Uh, four points this morning, uh, four headings, I guess you would say it that way. Uh, first would be the paradox of persecution. Second would be the reality of persecution. Third would be a beginner's guide to persecution. And fourth, the blessing, the surprising blessing of persecution. Let's talk about the paradox of persecution. So a paradox is something that's seemingly contradictory. Now, if you have your copy of God's Word, you can see it very tangibly in front of you, but there is something that happens between the seventh and the eighth beatitude. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God, followed up by blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Now here's the paradox. As you are at peace with God, as you seek to get in there and make peace with other people, you will be persecuted. As you enter places of conflict to make peace, as you enter places of conflict to show a way forward, people will not embrace you with open arms. So Jesus anticipates this. There's a paradox of living out a life of mercy. There's a paradox of living out a life that's single-minded or single-heartedness. There's a paradox of living out a life that hungers and thirsts for righteousness in all things, in all places, in all these beatitudes. And for that, you will face rejection. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, says, In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Think about what Jesus says here. It's blessed are those who are persecuted for what? For righteousness' sake. So here's, here's a couple of causes of persecution. You're, one, persecuted because of righteousness. As you hold firm to Jesus in his way, you have this personal righteousness, but also this public righteousness, and for that, people will reject you. Let's think, let's think about personal righteousness for just a moment. In the book, Good Faith, which is a, a wonderful book, if you happen to want to pick up a book and read it, it's written by David Kinnaman and Gabe Lyons. They point out in, in a survey done that modern Christians are perceived by two defining words. The first word is irrelevant, and the other word is extreme. And so if you're living out your faith, living out a Christian ethic, a personal and a public righteousness, you'll be pursued as having nothing really to speak into society, nothing to add, irrelevant. And when you do take your faith seriously, people see you as a fanatic. I mean, just try it out for a second. Try out a historical Christian sexual ethic created by God. Jesus lays out a way for sexual flourishing in marriage and for all of life. At best, you'll be made fun of, moving on to dislike, then pushed to the margins, and eventually called dangerous. Try out an ethic for how we might use our time and our bodies, and our money, and see what people say about it. Maybe try out an ethic, try out a a righteousness that values life at every stage of living. Feel how homeless of a Christian you can become very quickly if you engage fully as an advocate for the life of the unborn, made in the image of God, and... So I'm going to whole life ethic and engage fully as an advocate for refugees on American soil made in the image of God. If you pick a whole life ethic over, a, over an alliance with a platform, see what kind of fun ensues for you. But also our public righteousness is a problem as well, isn't it? You push forward as a peacemaker. You try to introduce the shalom of God into all that you do. You try to build the beautiful city. It's already been sung about this morning. You try to create the beloved community Martin Luther King Jr. spoke about. You try to be those who are out there with the presence of of the kind of deeds that make reconciliation between two people, saying 
We need to reconcile one another, saying we need to be together on this. You're out there uh, not taking sides, but pressing on issues that take and steal life from all of us across the board, infusing the presence of righteousness and justice in all things. You're out there trying to put, pump in the presence of love into a society. There's this Christ-driven or kingdom-driven push forward to pump in love into all things. It's like a kingdom-driven push against power or status quo to get people out of their comfortable, lukewarm waters of how life is supposed to be going. There will be resistance. You know what Jesus is saying? Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. And if you do all those things, right, all those things, with a great deal of love for sinners and sufferers, do you know what people will call you? Soft. And your way will be rejected. If you follow the whole Jesus, if you follow the real Jesus, if you preach the whole Jesus, people will reject at least part of you and possibly all of you. This is a great line, a great quote from Derwin Gray in his book, The Good Life. It's on the Beatitudes. He says this, When we love with a Jesus kind of love, the religious will persecute us for, uh, for eating with those they deem unacceptable and irredeemable. When we pursue the righteousness and moral purity called for by the gospel and proclaim that Jesus is the only way to the Father, the irreligious will persecute us and call us uh, self-righteous, self-righteous and narrow-minded. We will be too conservative for the liberals and we will be too liberal for the conservatives Love is the language of God's kingdom. Jesus is the rabbi who teaches us how to live in uh, his Father's language. And the Spirit empowers us to be living letters that shout from the rooftops, how great is our God. So Jesus says you'll be persecuted because of righteousness, for righteousness' sake, but also, secondly, he says, because of me. On account of me, he says, it'll happen. Because of Jesus. Jesus told his disciples, If people hate you, keep in mind that they hated me first. Do you know how we know this? Because the one chance humanity had to get their hands on God, you know what they did? Killed him. You know, the gospel, the gospel is this beautiful message that we all rally around weekly, right? The message of Christ. The gospel is this. The gospel is the good news that Jesus has defeated sin, death, and evil through his own death and resurrection, and is making all things new, even us. And as he's making all things new, even us, there is an already but not yet part of that. We are engaged in the battle of the ages. And so to align with Jesus is to align against evil, and it brings you into the crosshairs of this battle of the ages to be on the redemptive edge of things. You know those places where Jesus calls us to, the places where light is piercing into darkness, to be on the redemptive edge of things is to fight darkness. Darkness is not not going down without a fight. So Jesus says you'll be persecuted for righteousness' sake, but also because of me. You've aligned your heart and your life with me and what I'm doing. We also talked this morning about the reality of persecution. So is this a real thing? This is a fair question. Is this a thing that we're making up to kind of bring us together? Let's talk about it. This is a reality that Jesus is walking through with us, and a reality that we are walking through and Jesus is forming us. Uh, John Tyson, who's a pastor, uh, in New York City, uh, probably a challenging place to be a Christian, uh, he outlines uh, three kinds of persecution we might undergo, physical persecution, verbal, and then emotional. So physical persecution is this, that there are actually, for your faith, hands are laid on you, right? Was that ever like a term when y'all were growing up? Like, hey, we're about to lay hands. Like, not like in the prayer sense, but like in the fighting sense. Like, hands are laid on you, all right? You face imprisonment, you're cut off from commerce, you're unable to work or even to own things and possibly even murdered for your Christian faith. And we have to acknowledge that as we sit here today, 
where we are, that our experience is peculiar among uh, worldwide Christians, uh, both now and also historically. There are Christians in Myanmar who are being oppressed and tortured uh, by their country's military government. We have brothers and sisters in North Korea, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, Nigeria, being persecuted, in prison, there's violence taken out against them, there's kidnappings and even death. In, in the last year, and I think this will be on the screen here for you, in the last year, there have been over 360 million Christians living in places where they experience high levels of persecution and discrimination. Nearly 6,000 Christians are killed for their, were killed for their faith. This is last year. Not 2020, not the crazy year, the last year, right? 5,111, uh, 110 churches and other Christian buildings were attacked. 4,765 believers detained without trial. They were arrested, sentenced, and imprisoned. And for us, as we think about that, uh, we think through this and we just stop and we have this, we need to have a deep sense of compassion for our brothers and sisters around the world. In fact, we pause because we want to carry the weight in our prayer and in our mission. We want to pray for Jesus to sustain his people across the planet and Jesus to continue to raise up his people in every place and among every tribe and every nation. So I want to stop for a moment. And we want to pray for the persecuted church around the world who are experiencing this. I've invited Caleb Hunt. You guys likely have met Caleb. Married to Abigail Johnston Hunt, if you don't know Caleb. Uh, Caleb and Abigail are in the pipeline to be uh, International Mission Board missionaries. And so I've invited Caleb to come and, and just to lead us in a prayer for the persecuted church. Father in heaven, we bless you for the words spoken by your son, Jesus Christ, that those who are persecuted are blessed and to them belong the kingdom of heaven. We bless you for the examples of the saints who have suffered before us, from Abel to Zechariah, from the apostles to early Baptists in England, from those Christians blamed for the fall of Rome to African-American Christians during the civil rights era in the United States. Give us grace, Lord, to consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. By the same spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead after he suffered persecution, strengthen your church to encounter and endure persecution as faithful servants. For our brothers and sisters in Laos who are imprisoned for shepherding the flock, we pray. For our brothers and sisters in India who have had their homes and churches burned, we pray. For our brothers and sisters in Brazil who are targeted by cartels for defending the victims of the drug and sex trade, we pray. For our brothers and sisters in Nigeria who have been kidnapped for pursuing a Christian education, we pray. For our brothers and sisters in Ukraine who are ministering to wounded, abused, and displaced, we pray. For our brothers and sisters in the United States who have lost or left jobs for refusing to bow the knee to the God of prophet, we pray. Lord, hear our prayer. Amen. As we think about the persecuted church, we, we do so also to learn from them. It's not to shame or even to downplay uh, any sort of persecution we feel here. Every pain is real. But it is to draw strength from those um, who experience persecution because of their faith, and yet they do it with joy. It's an amazing paradox, isn't it? You know, uh, what we might feel locally, I would describe as increasing 
and uh, painful here and now. At one time in, in America, the church was at the very center of American life. And I think in a lot of ways we feel the pain as uh, that influence, that ability to shape society is fading and is no longer the case. So we think about other types of persecution, verbal persecution. That's when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you, Jesus says. They falsely speak against you. There's wrong, wrongful accusations leveled against you, against Christians, against Christianity and what you believe. And it's not new for Christians to be maligned and misunderstood. Uh, there's oftentimes just in general a very street level disdain for religion or people of convictions. Believing a particular thing draws disdain from people. Holding a historical, a historical faith feels out of touch to people, narrow, fanatical, even dangerous. Again, think of the, the words that, that uh, the good faith pointed out to us. The perception is that Christians are either irrelevant or extreme. Nothing of value to speak into society. And when you do take your faith seriously, it makes you a crazy person. There's also emotional persecution to insult you or publicly shame you, to mock or to tear you down to the end of tearing down your faith, to the end of, of inviting you through this public shame just to blend into the way of the world, to join in the lukewarm waters again of the status quo. It's also, it's also worth stating here that there is a persecution out there that I would call illegitimate persecution. It's to have this sort of exaggerated view as a persecuted minority. And oftentimes when this happens, it's not what I would call biblical persecution. It, was, it is to identify the Christian, but to present your faith and your model of Christianity that has nothing to do with Jesus. And as you, as you present a kind of faith that has nothing to do with Jesus, you act out in a way that is foreign to Jesus in his way, people then accuse you of things. Go figure. It's not biblical persecution. It's first, it's accountability. You say you follow Jesus, you look nothing like Jesus. You say you follow Jesus, you scream nothing like Jesus, <laughs> you know? It's accountability. But also it's a human resistance to a lack of kindness and understanding in human lives. It is not what Jesus is talking about. We follow his way, persecuted because of righteousness, persecuted because of him, not these other things I'm going to cry foul about, Right? So, here's my beginner's guide to persecution. Are we doing okay? I mean, like, it's cloudy today. It's like, why waste a sunny day talking about this, right? Beginner's guide to persecution. I would just say this. Know what biblical Christianity is. Don't get worked up about society and by God's common grace society holding you accountable because you live some other way. Know what biblical Christianity is and live it. It also means you go into every situation. You decide now, middle schoolers, high schoolers, employees, friends, Christians, you decide now. You set your convictions. You set your integrity now. And you follow through. And let it land where it lands. And thirdly, it means that we also willingly live as faithful exiles. We want to be at the center of society. We want to set the tone. We want to be the people in our society who wear the letterman jackets and everything rolls downhill, right? But the Bible gives us over and over and over again pictures of Christians in every time and every place living as exiles. People whose citizenship is somewhere else. And because of the way we live, we're on the outs with the locals. So go ahead and set your mind to willingly live as a faithful, faithful, faithful exile. We end here. The surprising blessing of persecution. You know, um, I would describe my generation as the, the free trial generation, you know, like free trial subscription. You see those pop up everywhere? 
So like TV is different now. So like you have all these streaming services. And what do you know? You can sign up for six months for free, right? Or seven days. But you got to check after seven days because they'll make you put that credit card in ahead of time. You know, the gospel is this. The gospel is not, the call of the gospel is not to deny your neighbor, take up your comfort, and follow your dreams. The call of the gospel is to live life for righteousness sake. The call of the gospel is to live on account of Jesus and for the sake of Jesus. We're reminded by the call of the gospel that our, uh, our real treasure, the real treasure of our lives, is Jesus. And we can't think of Jesus, our real treasure, as just, you know, as so, you know, so Jesus is a consumer good. We follow him, we get all the upgrades, we level up on our life, and then Jesus, when the benefits are finally gone, we cancel the subscriptions, right? It's not a free trial subscription kind of thing. And with that, as we follow Jesus, as we hold firm to him and his way, as we face life exiled to the margins, we do so in a way that's steady and joyful and humble and courageous. We hold fast to our faith. We hold fast and we're willing to love and to share and to serve and to do good to all, even those who hate us. We're committed to returning, uh, returning good instead of evil with this strong hope that all wrongs will be righted, and nothing we do now, nothing we endure now, is wasted. So what are these blessings? What is this blessing of persecution? Jesus says, rejoice and be glad. Great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You fall within a long line of those who lived out the righteous life, who lived faithfully in in their time, those in history who lived for something more than just simply what was in history, those who identified with God. God called them out of the world. Jesus called them out of the world, and Jesus, Jesus called you out of the world. Also, we think about our reward, that our treasure is something greater than this world. It is the joy of being faithfully united with Jesus. There is joy in Christian conviction, knowing that our fidelity, our faithfulness is not about a commitment to a set of ideals. Our fidelity, our faithfulness is a commitment to a person, Jesus Christ. Christ is your great reward in heaven. We live our lives like like the psalmist in Psalm 73, whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth I desire than you great treasure of heaven. Rejoice and be glad the great treasure of heaven is Jesus, and you have him. Jesus also says this, blessed are those who are persecuted, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I want you to think with me back to a scene from Acts chapter 7, the stoning of Stephen. It'll be here on the screen here for you. Let me read it to you. Now when they heard these things, they were enraged. This is Stephen the first, this is the first recorded Christian martyrdom. Stephen is a witness of Jesus Christ as the great fulfillment of everything that had come uh, in, the Jew, in Jewish history. Now when they heard these things, they were enraged, and they ground their teeth at him. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed together at him. Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against him. Against them. And when he said this, he fell asleep. So, Stephen, first martyr, he gives witness to Jesus as Jesus calls his disciples to do You will be my witnesses. Stephen, here in this passage, is also a witness to something else. Stephen, it says he looks up and he sees something. 
He sees a greater reality superimposed over the normal reality. There's a heavenly court suddenly seen greater than the earthly one. Instead of the high priest and his fellow judges that are there gathered around him, rushing toward him, there's a scene with the God of glory himself sitting in judgment and with the Son of Man, Jesus, standing. Before the God of glory to act as an advocate in in the court. So the human judges might be condemning Stephen to death, but the heavenly court was finding favor in Stephen's life. There's Jesus standing upright. What the world calls blasphemous to be rejected, what the world throws on the garbage heap, Jesus stands and looks at and says, beloved, accepted, delighted in, well done. If you belong to Jesus, every conceivable situation you're in, you need to know this. He has set his affections upon you. And every conceivable situation that you're in is not for your ruin, but for glory. All wrongs against you will be set right. All patience under mockery will be vindicated. All shame will be be replaced with honor. All pain will be removed. All losses will be restored. All brokenness will be mended. All humiliation will be exchanged for glory. All slander will be revealed as false. And all of your life, that you might live in quiet anonymity, in faithfulness, unknown, unrecognized, uncelebrated, you will be known in glory and you will sing among the choir of the millions of redeemed. It is not for your ruin is for your glory. May we give ourselves to it. Pray with me, and we'll sing our song of response. Father in heaven, we love you. Oh, we love you. We praise you for your love for us, that it is no small thing to celebrate together that you say of us that we are beloved, we are accepted, we are delighted in. So, Father, we celebrate that now. May your love and your grace in these moments, these precious moments, may they stir us to praise. You are worthy of it all. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As we sing together, as we close, uh, we sing Grace Flows Down. I've asked Jill Curry if she'll uh, open the first part of the song and she'll uh, demonstrate how the melody goes for you if you need that, and then we'll all sing together. Please stand. Let's sing. Yeah.
Amen. As we go out this morning, let me take a few moments to remind you of a few things and then to invite you uh, into a few things as well. All these matters are in your bulletin for you this morning. Uh, we, our staff saw a shirt online. It's a black t-shirt, which may be like our staff uh, uniform pretty soon. It just says, like, it was in the bulletin multiple times. Um, and so if we have t-shirts on in the coming weeks, you'll know we pulled the trigger on that. You're invited this morning to give as an act of worship of your tithes and of your offerings. There are offering plates located behind you in the foyer. If you're a guest with us and you filled out that guest information card, you can drop that in the offering plate as well. Uh, remind you today, today is the last day that we'll be, like in this moment here, this is the last moment we'll be receiving deacon ballots uh, for nominations. Uh, so those will be uh, tallied up uh, right after the service. So you can drop that in the offering plate as well if you still brought yours with, with you this morning. Uh, you're invited tomorrow uh, to help out uh, with, with the Nehemiah teams, uh, 9 a.m., if you're able to do that. Uh, men's ministry are going out to the AOT center uh, and taking down the big meeting tent. Uh, so that's, that's available for you if you have a, a strong back and a weak mind, right? Or vice versa, who knows? Just show up. Um, also, looking ahead, this coming week uh, is, uh, it's coming Sunday, the 7th, is move-up day for those children uh, coming into the children's department, going out of the children's department, moving into the youth ministry. Uh, we, were, we were reminded this week that, uh, that schools will be starting, teachers are going back and, and reporting, and, and so uh, just be in prayer for our teachers and for our students. Uh, there's a couple opportunities for you to... Um, engage in that. On Tuesday, there's a prayer time every Tuesday morning at 7 a.m. Uh, if you want to join in that morning prayer, it's right here in the sanctuary. This particular Tuesday in the evening from 5.15 to 6, uh, you have an opportunity to come to different schools around town uh, to do some prayer walking. We'll provide you with a few, some prayer prompts. Just move about uh, praying for teachers and for students and all that takes place on those campuses throughout the year. So that's Tuesday evening. We'll remind you of that as well. Uh, Golden Circle does meet this week at, uh, on Tuesday at 10 a.m. Uh, you also see in your bulletin an invitation to uh, a wedding shower uh, next Sunday, August 7th. Uh, Joshua Johnston uh, and his bride-elect Sarah. That's a shower honoring them. So that's next Sunday afternoon. Uh, and then also in your bulletin as a separate insert, there's information about our Wednesday night fellowship meals that are kicking off August 10th. And so you want to look at those as are menus ahead of time that Luann's prepared for us. If you want to get, be part of a standing reservation, meaning, meaning your name always stays on the list, you can do that in the office now. Uh, also, I know several of you kind of decide week by week. If you do that, we just need to know by Monday at 3 p.m. if you are or if you are not eating those fellowship meals. And I'm so looking forward to that. It's going to be great. It's going to be so great. All right. Next. You're invited into a Sunday school class. These are groups designed for discipleship and for community. If you're not part of one, I'd love to connect you in with one today. As we go out of worship this morning, would you stand with me and receive our benediction? If you would, raise your hands to receive the blessing. You have been called to the way of Jesus. Let nothing distract you. So may the love of God Almighty... Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be with you and abide with you today and forevermore. Go in peace.